Welcome to Alien Theorist Theorizing uh, special episode. This is we did an interview segment last year called Theorists in the Desert, and we're back at it again. This is, of course, the build up to Contact in the Desert, uh, June second to fourth in person this year. No more virtual nonsense. We don't have to do that. It's in person, uh, in the flesh, so to say. Uh, I'm Braden. I'm Zell. I'm Dan. And I'm Manu. And today we're joined Perfect. by a very Perfect. special guest, Dr. Manu Saves the Day, or Saves Zada. Thanks for the invitation. Mm-hmm. Yeah, for a quick, for people who don't know who he is, he's a medical doctor and scientist by academic training. Uh, he's obtained his MD and PhD degrees at the University of California, Irvine. After internship at Baylor University in Houston, Texas, he completed the STAR program. We've got to ask more about that immediately after this, combining resin, residency in dermatology and a postdoctoral fellowship program in molecular immunology. He currently works as a practicing physician for a single specialty group practice in Southern California. He entered the field of ancient historical mysteries as an independent researcher in 2016 with the publication of his first book about the architecture of the Great Pyramid. Since then, he has published several articles about Egypt's pyramids, the Great Sphinx, Gobekli Tepe, some together with co-authors Robert Buval, Robert Schock, and Robert Nyland. So Dr. Manu, or just Manu? Yeah, no doctor. just Manu. It's we'll, fine. we'll go out we'll all personal. Welcome well, because to I don't have any Rising. credentials. I don't have any credentials in, uh, in archaeology or Egyptology, so th- that's why it doesn't really make any sense for me to use the titles. <laughs> you're, the skin, you're the skin doctor, but you're just a avid, you're, you're super interested, I guess, in... Mm-hmm. The Sphinx, right. pyramids, and his, right. like historical mysteries. That's right. I'm a hobby Egyptologist. That's right. That's awesome. So, how, how did you? How did you? Let's start off. How did you fall down that path from a career as a dermatologist, and then into these historical mysteries? Well, I, I think I can blame it on Robert Bouval. I think it's his fault, uh, and he knows that he's responsible for it. <laughs> Um, he, uh, you know, when I read, uh, Orion, the Orion mystery, that's when, I, that's the first time I, I went from just watching regular programs on TV to actually, uh, looking things up myself. I thought it was just a fasc- fascinating book. Um, and that's kind of how things got going. Um, I read that book probably 15 years ago, I want to say. Um, but in, uh, 2016 is the first time that we, you know, I started actually researching and writing. Um, that's the book you just mentioned uh, that had to do with the uh, architecture of the Great Pyramid. And then in 2017, I actually met Robert. I met Graham and Robert together in uh, Croatia. We we took one of those tours that you probably well know about. In those days, they both of them they still used to do those things. And we had a we had them. Uh, we were together on a boat for a, a week, so it was amazing. We thought of conversations. And so during this trip, I got uh, a copy of Origins of the Sphinx. Robert and and Shock, they had just finished the book. Um, and so Buval brought a few copies. And one of the copies, he gave it to me. And I I got home from Croatia and I started reading the book. And so one thing led to another. And that, that's the, how the first paper got going with uh, with uh, Buval and Shock about uh, the lioness Mahit. Um, and then and on and on and on. So you know, you know how it is. Once you get once you get the spark, mm-hmm. then there's no stopping it. Down and down you go. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's. Uh, I mean, the same thing kind of happened with us on this on this show. It started off as a couple friends, you know, shooting the shit on a beach somewhere over a couple of beers. And next thing you know, as we moved ways, it it you know built and built and built until you, you know we you you kind of connect with people with the similar passion uh, mm-hmm. and next you, you can't catch yourself from falling down all the rabbit holes so it's it's always a f- uh, a fun world especially when we we get to meet other people that have uh, a real passion for this stuff yes yes so we can all relate to the same path yeah no, now what now, is it yeah go Sorry, ahead oh, i was just gonna go ask ahead. what uh like when you started going down the mystery of i mean specifically i guess like the great pyramid or like the the three main pyramids of giza what was the first like real mystery who, who kind of made you all think about like an alternative alternate theory of the of the pyramids because right now as it stands isn't it it's like khufu built this pyramid it's a tomb uh, but it contains really no hieroglyphs or 
and never found the body, which said, oh, it's probably you know, it was robbed, grave robbed, who knows how long ago. So what was the big mystery? What really draw, like, drew you down that rabbit hole? Uh, well, I was interested in a design, the idea behind the dimensions, uh, you know, and so that that had to do with astronomy for me because that that was actually my entry. So I looked at the dimensions of the Great Pyramid in cubits, and some of those numbers rang familiar from astronomy. So I came at this from astronomy, just like Robert did. Um, you know, Robert looked at the pyramid text and he found that. The pyramid texts don't only talk about a sun religion, but there's also a, a rich uh, tradition that talks about the stars and especially, you know, certain stars of significance. And Robert concluded that it is the stars that actually inspired um, the layout of the Giza pyramids. And so for me, the next logical step was, you know, well, if the stars gave rise to the layout of the pyramids, then uh, maybe some other astronomical objects gave rise to the dimensions of the actual pyramids themselves. And so this is kind of how I, um, I was interested. I was never really focused on the engineering of the, I know that's a big, of course, that's a big mystery. And a lot of people get interested in that, how the stones were cut, how the stones were lifted. Um, but uh, I initially started more interesting, for me, it was more the design was the more interesting part. And of course, since then, I've uh, uh, I've made friends with Jean-Paul Bouval. He's Robert's brother. He's an architect. And Jean-Paul and I, we talk every week. Uh, we're very close friends. And he's an architect by training. And um, between him and I, we always talk about design questions. Um, and, you know, we've published uh, actually something together in the form of a paper that we put on our academia page. We also made a video to explain and so that has to do with the numbers that uh, uh, underlie the, the the interior design of the Great Pyramid. So, so the design was always interesting to me. Well, that's a fascinating too. Like you said, people with the quarrying of the blocks and how and how they they built them is fascinating. But when you dive into all the hidden like numerology and stuff that's built in the design that's that's equally if not more fascinating because yeah. you know you could say on some grand scale okay like we could maybe figure out how they stack some blocks okay let's maybe we could figure that out but then when you look at the intricacies of like okay well now there's it's seemingly that there's there's like there's pattern mathematics astrology and all these hidden meanings in these in these structures that it just adds to the complexity of the pyramids themselves it's, it's just not you know these blocks stacked upon blocks to make a, a pier, you know a, tr a triangle shape in the middle of the desert there was meaning behind this and what that meaning yes. is is like, that's always been an avenue of fascination for me yeah yeah that's right now, uh, wasn't so, something about yeah. the, the Go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, sorry. I was just going to say, like, mm -hmm. so the uh, like the uh, Orion mystery, uh, those so the three pyramids of Giza, isn't it? Wasn't it their work saying something along the lines that it was how the Orion's belt was aligned, like in ten thousand BC, or a lot longer, or a lot earlier yes. than they thought the pyramids right. were built? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, it has to do with precession. Yeah. How this has to do with how the yeah. how stars below the ecliptic uh, process, and so that's a little bit different from ecliptic stars because it's a vertical displacement, an apparent displacement, because it's actually us that are rotating vis-a-vis -vis the sky. But what it ends up happening is that Orion is either really high up in the sky or very low, close to the horizon. But that's not the only thing. The other thing that changes is the rotation of the, um, of the constellation in such a way that the belt stars are either almost vertical or almost horizontal. Um, and so when you look at the actual orientation of the pyramids, the Giza pyramids, this is according to Robert's reconstruction, and you try to align the, the, the belt stars with that particular angle, let's say, vis-a-vis -vis the meridian, then you come up with uh, something like 10,500 um, BC. This is what Robert put together. Um, and then after Robert came... Gary Osborne and Scott Crichton, um, they, I can't remember the title of the book, but what they did is they, they kept, they developed this further and, uh, and proposed that the Queen Pyramids, there's three of them south of the Third Pyramid and there's three of them east of the First Pyramid, and they proposed that those pyramids are representing uh, the extreme orientation of the belt stars 
at the extremes of the processional cycle. So if the uh, when the, the Orion constellation is all the way it, it's at its highest point, that's when you have the vertical orientation. That would be the equivalent of the Queen pyramids next to the Great Pyramid. And then if the when the Orion constellation is close to the horizon, then you have a more um, uh, I hope I'm getting this correct now. So then you have a then you have a more horizontal uh, orientation, and that would be equivalent to the pyramid south of Menkaure's pyramid or the, the third pyramid. So that's Scott Crichton and Gary Osborne that developed this further. And I don't know if you know, but Gary's most recent data now he's looking at the quantification of this time scale. So he's actually looking now at the Giza diagonal, um, and again with respect to precession, and he's now quantifying specific points on that line uh, and what they might mean in terms of the Peniston code. As you know, Gary's working on the Peniston code, and that is relevant to what you guys are interested in. So, so I'm just trying to yeah. connect all these different offers so you see the big picture, the big concept behind the processional. Um, and there's one more thing I should mention. So Graham Hancock and Robert Bouval published a, a great book. It's called Mystery of the Sphinx. This is the late 90s. And they're the ones that actually then propose that the Giza Plateau is a megalithic processional clock, right? They incorporated the Sphinx, um, they incorporated the three Giza pyramids, and what they were saying is that, yes, maybe the Giza Plateau was constructed in the Old Kingdom, but it is commemorating a time long before the Old Kingdom, specifically Zep Tepe, um, and, uh, and so they were basically uh, proposing that if you if you look at if you reconstruct uh, if you put the lion back due east so at that time old kingdom the lion would would rise uh, at the summer solstice but if you put it back to the uh, vernal equinox in other words where the sphinx is looking that's you rewinding the processional clock back and how long do you rewind it and that's the famous scene where Gam Graham is sitting next to Robert and Robert is showing this to him on the computer and that rewinds to 10,500 BC. And that, and so, cause the Sphinx is, they think it's been recarved to a, maybe a Pharaoh's face, but originally a lion, right? Like a Correct. lion's yeah, face a lion so representing like a time of time of Leo or like the pointing yes. to the constellation Leo. That's right. So this is part of John Anthony West and Robert Schock's uh, uh, proposal uh, in that well-known documentary, uh, um, I hope I didn't get the titles wrong. I think so. I think that's Mystery of the Sphinx, maybe, or I, you, you know, this the documentary with Charlton Heston narrating. Um, and in that documentary, they're proposing just that, that the Sphinx was originally a male lion. Uh, now, since then, uh, we have new evidence that suggests that it was a female lion. So it was a lioness. And we even have a name for this lioness, uh, Mehit. And this is my contribution to the field. Um, this is in 2017. Um, I had this insight. I had some initial preliminary evidence, and I proposed it to Bouval and Shock over breakfast, basically in Sedona. And um, and <laughs> what yeah. a breakfast! Yeah, it was a it was an amazing breakfast. Yeah, um, and so <laughs> we ended up writing the paper about this. Um, I don't know if you guys seen it, but it has to do with uh, the lioness Mahit. And since then, I've developed this further. I found more evidence. And uh, the newest uh, iteration of this is in the book Under the Sphinx. So there's a chapter devoted to Mahit, and that's where I'm, you know, listing even more evidence. And since the book came out, I have found yet more evidence that further bolsters this uh, model. So what we're saying is that before the Sphinx, there was a statue of a lioness, not a lion, a lioness there. And the name of that statue in the early dynastic period was Mahit. And in your in your book under the Sphinx, uh, what you, your most recent work, um, you uh, one of the other mysteries, like not only the interesting part about Mahit being the the name of the lioness or the original name for the the Sphinx. I mean, uh, you put together a, a pretty cogent argument for there being. Uh, I think most of the people people who are into our show and people who have you know an interest in Egypt have heard of the the chamber underneath or the mm -hmm. void underneath the Sphinx. Yes. Um, uh, one of the, one of the, mi the grand mysteries of the Giza, one of the many grand mysteries of the Giza plateau, um, you know, popularized by the, you know, everybody's favorite sleeping prophet, Edgar Cayce. Um, 
now you had some interesting you had some interesting thoughts on what possibly may have been inside that void yes uh, yes that's right so uh you can take that if you want <laughs> that was no, that no, was no. the cia no, telling him no, not to, no, that's not not to yeah. <laughs> don't talk no more no more yeah. talking yeah yeah not about uh, giving up right. too many secrets <laughs> yeah that was your colleague maria actually calling i think i think she's just trying to make sure maybe she wants she's knocking the door she wants to come into the chat room something like that um, yeah the hall of records well see i i i mean you know obviously there's a lot of people that have written about it talked about it so in order to take this to the next level what had to be done is to look at the actual written evidence by the ancient Egyptians. And that's not easy to do because most people in the alternative camp cannot read hieroglyphic. Um, you know, they, um, so they have to, they have to use evidence from Edgar Casey himself, for example. Uh, and that's fair. That's fine. Um, but that's not, I did, I, you know, for me to just repeat that, that wouldn't be anything novel. So I wanted to add something to the field. I wanted to give something solid to the field that they can cite in the future when there is a debate about these things. And especially because it helps us to, to make a testable prediction. It's a science. So I'm using, I'm approaching this like a science project. And out of this, so the evidence is, is, is probable cause for a drilling experiment in front of the Sphinx. This, that, that is the purpose of Under the Sphinx. The entire book was written with one simple purpose in mind, to provide the probable cause so that we can knock on the door one more time and ask for a drilling permit. Um, so, so the upshot of what I found is that, yes, the, the ancient Egyptians themselves referred to uh, a space under the feet of, of Hormachet, the Great Sphinx, and inside of that space they said is the book of Thoth, the written will of the, the moon god. Uh, and this is from the New Kingdom. So, and this is this is in the British Museum. It's a hieratic papyrus. Anybody can go and look at this, look at the translation, and there it is. And this is 3,200 years ago, long before Edgar Cayce, long before the esotericists talked about a Hall of Records. So my conclusion is that they were onto something. This is a legend that had a seed of truth but that seed comes to us from the, the ancient Egyptians themselves. So this is my starting point. When I saw that, I realized, okay, I have a real mystery here on my hands. And so this is something that needs to be investigated. Uh, now to get to your question, if you remember, Edgar Casey predicted that that chamber is sealed. And so if it's truly sealed, then the content could be destroyed. Um, but in any case, it wouldn't be available for any of us. But if something could be found that is so strange in ancient Egyptian culture that it doesn't fit and that we, if we could show that it had to come from another place and another time, then that would bust open this, uh, this uh, model that, uh, that the chamber is sealed. And that, exa that is how I got into Under the Sphinx because there's a painting Egyptologists know about it. It comes from the Middle Kingdom. It was painted onto the, the headboard of a coffin. And that painting, to cut to the chase, in my reconstruction, and I'm looking at the written text around it, various other texts that relate to this, and it's, and it's basically a depiction of the heliocentric solar system with nine planets encircling the sun in the center. Now, this is not something that the ancient Egyptians knew. And we know this for a fact. So how did they come into possession of such a painting that shows such astronomical uh, observations that they couldn't have made? And so the one way to explain it is that they tapped into an archive where that knowledge was being stored. And, and so that was the next step in the book. Uh, I'm following that trace and it takes me back to Giza. It takes me to a real archive that has a mythological correlate and the mythological aspect of this archive is fascinating because it contains the words of god that is where god's word the words are stored so this is not just some archive this is the archive this is the ark of egypt the the genesis archive so to speak um and so you could say well this is just in the mythical coffin texts um but the 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 beauty of it is there's actually a real archive that has exactly the same name, and it was the Royal 
the royal scribe, the chief scribe, was in charge of it. And there's a there's a reference to it in the funerary, uh, you know, st stone plates, the direct reference to it. And then uh, the final step is to basically trace this back to a statue um, that was guarding it. And that statue was Mahit, the line, as I just mentioned. So I can take this back to the very beginning of Egyptian civilization. There's even a written reference of opening of the place of an archive. Even that exists in in the in the records of uh, the early early dynasties, so all of this I put into the book. Um, you know, anybody who's interested, who's who ever needs to, you know, put some beef under a Hall of Records argument, can go to this book. It's fully there's a full bibliography. There's there's end notes. There's an index, and I made it like that so people have a reference if they need some like some solid backing. Um, for this Hall of Records idea. And of course, ultimately, the goal is to do another drill to prove once and for all, or to falsify, whether or not there's such a space in front of the Sphinx. So y y your proposal is that underneath there, there was some, maybe some sort of time capsule Hall of Records where all these ancient texts that you know, far outdated that were basically evidence of a pre-existing society before the Egyptians. Yes. And that this, this was cracked open and right. well, possibly cracked open. And the evidence would suggest that these, uh, these were removed. I, I love that theory. Cause I was, as I like kind of look, you, you know, you, if, if you're a fan of Hancock's work and, you know, all these uh, ancient civilizations, it, it it does kind of make sense for me. And it's, it's an interesting way of how you found it. It's kind of like, you're just, you followed the trail of breadcrumbs that you had uh, to this kind of discovery. Um, how, how was that? I was just curious, like, as I was, I was listening to you on other interviews, like when you're making, when you're having these Eureka moments, like, how's that feeling? Like, it, uh, does it, is it a, like an amazing discovery for you? Like, how, how does it feel when you make these connections and, and, and then there's, there's more breadcrumbs, you know, when you're, following this trail how does that feel yeah yeah this it's an amazing uh it's an amazing experience because it's amazing for you but not amazing for your friends and family because you completely shut them out <laughs> uh <laughs> and that that is one of the sacrifices that you're making because when you're in when you when you start catching when you see these things unfold in front of you and you follow these trails and you you make these little discoveries then you can't stop it just keeps you it keeps you going and going and going um and uh you know and then you, once you finish it you're just exhausted in a, but in a good way um yeah it's 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 very very special um and, and especially that painting you know when i saw that i immediately realized i'm, I'm looking at something that's uh that's out of that's out of egypt it's not something that fits into that culture uh, and even Egyptologists themselves had a problem interpreting this. Um, and, you know, and then, for example, the, the, other, uh, the other thing that was amazing was when I finally realized that there is a real counterpart to the mythical archive that I was reading about in the coffin text. Um, to, to just fill in that little detail, so the, the exact archive is a portable box. That, that is the word that is present from the very beginning of writing. It's called Afdet. That's the name, the hieroglyphic name for a portable archive, just like the Ark of the Covenant. And as far as I know, currently, the information, one of the pieces of information in that box was this, it was astronomical in nature. It was, the, it was the idea that the sun was in the center and it was surrounded by nine objects, just like planet, planetary uh, orbits. Uh, so this is what I can show comfortably with the written evidence. There may be other, there may have been other things and there may have been other boxes, yes, but it isn't in the way I see this, it's not a library with shelves and books in it. No, it's a, it's an old fashioned, no. you know, I, I don't know if you remember, but in Lost, in, uh, um, in the uh, Indiana Jones movie series, right? At the end, when he's looking for the Holy Grail and he walks into this cave, right? And there's the, yeah. the Knight of the Templar. He's guarding all these grails yeah. and Pen all these grails. Pen and a man. That's right. <laughs> and they're golden and diamond studded, but their actual grail is just a little wooden uh, chalice. Yeah. It's a simple item. And so this is kind of the same feeling I had when I finally realized that we're not, lo we're not looking for uh, uh, you know, a library of Alexandria, we're looking for just a box, something and really that, simple. That would make, 
that would make sense. That makes a lot of sense because if you think the pyramid structure, that structure, the shape in itself, if you take out all the construction and the anything, it's a very simple shape. But yes. hidden in it is a ton of information. So if that is, if that we're kind of looking at that on, in another thing, it could just be, yeah, like a, a simple item. And in within that, whatever it is, is a bunch of hidden information, right? Because it, it doesn't have to yeah. be grand scale to hide these things. No. These calculations could be in something small, like a box, right. you said. That's yeah, this is what I, I, I loved about the discovery is that it was such a, something that was completely surprising. You know, I, I mean, you have, you know, you have to have preconceived notions sometimes when you go into a research project, but then when you get surprised like that, the trail leads you to something complete, you know, like a, something that you didn't expect. That's actually, that has the hallmark of a real discovery because you, you are surprised. And I was certainly surprised when I realized that the Hall of Records is, an, is a portable box uh, and that the Egyptians um, wrote about it at length in the coffin text. Um, now, in, in your research, now here's a question that that just popped into my head right now, um, and maybe you can help, uh, you know, put some put some pieces into place. Now, in in these texts and the research that you've done, were were there caretakers of this information, like a, a librarian or a sect of priests or something that were responsible for the maintaining of this uh, of this, uh, you know, annex or whatever it is, this 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 box? Like, who who kept it? Who would have kept it? you know, maintained yeah. or safe. Right? Yeah. So in the, in the, um, in the, in the written records talk about, you know, Mahit is guarding a shrine, uh, a writer's shrine um, from the beginning of Egyptian civilization. And so what these scribes were in charge of was basically the king's affairs. They were, uh, they were shipping, they were um, sealing shipments to the king's grave, to the king's estates, and those seals had that written information. And those seals and those scribes were basically operating out of a, out of a, uh, a bureau, if you want. And that bureau was in the, in the shape of an animal shrine. Uh, and that, that's actually depicted on these seals. Um, and so the, it's, it's the scribes and the, these royal archivists that were guarding this this information um so they were generating it they were storing it and they were guarding it um and we know this because later a few centuries later so in the during the time the, during the pyramid age that title still survives up until the the reign of Khafre. um and this is this is a very exclusive title it's a it's a title that uh um that refers to the vizier as the chief of the royal scribes, uh, the master of the royal scribes, and then the master of the, this is in my reconstruction, of the opener of Mehit. So that means the opener, the one that has the key to the archive that's guarded by Mehit. Um, and so this is an exclusive title. It's only the, the top guy in the administration had it. So these guys were basically guarding it, and symbolically, the archive was guarded by a giant statue in the form of a lion, a lioness. Hey guys, thanks for watching. I know it's annoying to watch these broken up in 10 minute segments, but here's the next one over here. Or if you want to watch the whole thing uncut and after hours, just click this link to our website and uh, give us a donation. You get full access to it on Patreon. Anyways, thanks guys. Enjoy the next video.